This morning we are in the book of James. The book of James. And we will finish out chapter 1 this morning. Um, We are all probably mostly familiar with this epistle of James because of the way it has been mishandled so horribly um, (laughs) in the past uh, in regards to works and faith. Um, James' main, main purpose here is to issue a call for observing a faith that professes and practices. And the emphasis in this section is on the dangers of self-deception, deceiving your own selves, as we see in verse 22, or deceives his own heart, as we see in verse 26. It's very important that we keep in mind that James was writing to born-again believers. Therefore, the text cannot be speaking of the necessity of works for eternal life. He is instead instructing believers in regards to a profitable means of living life. In other words, this text is not evangelistic. It is instructive. And I say this because the text that we'll be studying presents a very difficult verse 25. One that has been explained in a myriad of ways. And we'll we'll get to this a little bit later, of course. But also, we will eventually be presented with this statement from James But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And that statement and the section of text it comes from has been handled so terribly by so many, stealing away the assurance that God gives the one who believes Christ. But for now, we are in chapter 1, and here James not only calls his readers to positive action, but also to eliminate immorality in their lives. In the process of making his point, James brings up a a central paradox of faith. That is, God's gift brings the responsibility of moral behavior. Of course, this ties in with what James said about temptation from last week. So he's, he's not jumping gears here. If a Christian sins because Satan deceives him, that that is one thing. But if he deceives himself, then that is a far more serious matter. Now, I'm going to make a statement that can easily be misunderstood, and that is this. Many people are deceiving themselves into thinking they are saved when they are not. They are counterfeit, And by emphasis on works, they lead other people astray. Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23. Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you practice lawlessness. We're probably all aware that there are those who believe they are Christian because they are American, or they grew up in the South, or they, their, their parents and their parents' parents attended church, uh, which, of course, all these assumptions are wrong. There are also those who believe they are Christian because they do certain works, believing they're saved by those works, or that they play a role in sustaining their saved status by those works. They have neglected the gospel of grace by faith in Jesus Christ. But then there are those who are born-again believers, who believe Jesus and are saved, and yet also at the same time live as immorally as you can imagine. They neglect or even reject what Paul preached to believers through many of his epistles. 
Paul did not preach the gospel of salvation to convert believers, but to bring unbelievers to belief in Jesus and thus eternal life. But Paul and the other biblical authors who wrote to believers wrote to instruct them in living life to glorify God, which would then turn into or bring forward future reward, even ruling and reigning with Christ. Which was also a good news message, by the way. It was the gospel for believers. Part of which was that believers are empowered by the indwelling Holy Spirit to be victorious over sin and live in, live lives that are pleasing to the Lord. So while there are non-believers who have tricked themselves or been tricked into believing that they are saved in regards to eternal life, there are at the same time Christians who are fooling themselves concerning their Christian walk. They think they're spiritual when they are actually not. Such was probably the case with the believers to whom the author of Hebrews wrote, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. They had thought that their complicated intermixing of the old covenant and the new covenant meant that they were They were awfully smart people, but the author instead said it meant they were awfully immature. The immature believer pretends to believe one thing while doing works that say something completely different. He believes he has everything he needs according to his own desires. The lukewarm and morally deluded church of Laodicea um, would deny rebuke and, and correction saying, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But it's a mark of maturity when a person faces himself honestly, knows himself, and admits his needs. Christian spiritual maturity requires a born-again believer knowing what God's Word says and caring about it. There's no reason to expect a non-Christian to display characteristics of spiritual maturity. But we see so often today Christians expressing shock that unbelievers would act like unbelievers. I think the greater shock should be when a believer chooses to act like an unbeliever. Obviously, that person, while saved, yet has no understanding. They are spiritually immature. And in terms of their eternal life, are short-sighted. Of course, if spiritual maturity is tied to a believer knowing and caring what God's Word says then it is no wonder so many are spiritually immature given the priority of so many churches today. Which is not teaching God's Word. In John 17, 17, the Bible testifies that God's Word is truth. And the Psalms say the judgments of the Lord are true. And your law is truth. And all your commandments are truth. Many other places testify of the divine origins of the Bible, that it is all truth, that it is pure, that it is without flaw. And if we're rightly related to God's truth, we do not need to ignore His Word, but rather desire to know it so that we may glorify God in our mature handling of it. So that's That's my setup for us this morning, moving to this next section of James. So let's pray, and then we will dig right on into the text. Lord, as we embark on the study of your word, we ask that you would open up our hearts to receive all that you have to say to us, Lord, that we would desire to be hearers 
but also doers. And that you would lead us in all of your good ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been on a really slow path through James so far, um, but we'll be kind of picking up the pace. Today I'd like for us to finish out this first chapter. We spent two weeks uh, in this chapter already, and we still have verses 19 through 27 to go here. Um, In week one of our study, as I like to do, we covered the author, the date, the setting, and the reason for this letter. It was written by James, the brother of of Jesus. It was written between 40 and 50 A.D., um, probably around 48 A.D., making it likely the first book of what we call our New Testament. It was written to Christian Jews who were living outside the land of Israel. It was written as a sermon to bring understanding of works and grace to the believing Jews, probably written just after the Jerusalem Council that we find in, in, in Acts chapter 15. Now, in verses 1 through 8, we learned about trials, tests, and temptations. We learned that trials and tests can be profitable to the Christian. Trials and tests work uh, for us rather than against us because God uses these things to refine us. We also learned that through that, that though God does not tempt us, Satan yet does. Um, Satan does not tempt those who are already dead in their sins and trespasses. They are already a part of Satan's kingdom. We learned that trials and tests are used by God as a means of continuing sanctification. We learned to pray for wisdom when we find ourselves in trials. God will give us wisdom not to waste those opportunities that we have in testing so that we can mature. And finally, we learn to ask for wisdom in faith. And then a couple of weeks later, with verses 9 through 18, we learn that many of those to whom this letter was written were enduring financial hardship. The financial trials of these believers did not mean that they were by any means secondhand Christians. That's because no matter how low they were in terms of the world's goods, they were exceedingly rich in spiritual terms. We then learn that God does not help us by removing trials, but by making trials work for us. And the point James made was that we can endure trials joyfully because we know that God is doing a good work with us. We also learned The steps in the process of sin, desire, deception, disobedience, and death. And we ended by learning that it is important for us to know who we are in God. Of all the creatures God has in this vast universe, Christians are first to God. But sharing God's nature, it is beneath our dignity to accept Satan's bait, or to desire sinful things. So that's where we are now in this chapter. We are at a therefore. We are at the section where, based on what he has previously written, James answers the question, so what? Verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man... Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So we start with so then. It's as good as a therefore in drawing a connection to what was previously said. In the case of the original readers, they were Christian Jews who were living outside of the land of Israel. They were in difficult times. And James wrote to instruct them regarding glorifying the Lord living in those dire circumstances that they were in. However, these are good things for us to consider today too. So then, first of all, be quick to listen. The believer should be attentive to what God has to say. In other words, surfing the web on on our cell phones during the service to figure out lunch plans, probably not something you should be doing. We should also receive a warning here that just because God spoke to Elijah in a still small voice does not mean that every still small voice you hear in your head is God. 
If God wants you to hear him, you will hear him. No doubt. And in fact, he's given you the means to hear him whenever you want. Because you have this, right? What we must do is confirm everything by what we know is certain and what we know is written in the Word of God. In regards to James' original readers who were under testing, a willingness to listen helps with endurance. And I think we can move that on towards us today, apply that to ourselves. A willingness to listen helps with endurance. Most people seem to want to talk more than listen. I feel like I should be quiet now. But especially, people want to talk when they're going through trials instead of listening. But really, we do better to be attentive to the wisdom of God through His written word or through the biblical counsel of others when we are in the midst of trials. And so then James says, be slow to speak, which is obviously connected to being quick to listen. It's a good practice for everyone who is under stress to cover his mouth, that is to to be slow to speak, and again, to listen to godly input. Most of us have two ears and one mouth. I've only known one person that, well, no, I've known nobody that didn't have two ears and one mouth. That ought to remind us to listen twice as much as we speak. Many times we argue with God's Word. Now, I doubt if you're like arguing out loud, but perhaps you are. (laughs) Proverbs 10 says, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. And Proverbs 17 says, He who has knowledge spares his words. If the lawyer in Luke 10 had been slow to speak, he would have considered what Jesus had said to him before he went and asked, and who is my neighbor? And notice that both of these things require restraint. And you know what else requires restraint, especially when you feel cornered by difficulties. Be slow to wrath. James warns that man's anger does not produce righteousness. In fact, anger is just the opposite of the patience of God who wants to produce in our lives as we mature in Christ. You may remember in 2 Samuel 12 that when the prophet Nathan told King David the story about the stolen lamb, the king became angry. But as we know, he became angry at a fictional character which was actually a representation of himself. You are the man, said Nathan. And not in a good way, not like you're the man, you know. But you're the one. And then David immediately confessed, I have sinned. In the garden, when Jesus was being betrayed and arrested, Peter was slow to hear. He was swift to speak and swift to anger. And he almost killed a man with a sword. Not even a guard, but a servant. It's so easy for us to become angry at the wrong thing, angry at God, angry at what the Bible says, angry at one another. But there is a godly anger against sin, often presented in the text of of the Bible, James warns us against getting angry at God's word because it reveals our sin to us. Like the man who broke the mirror because he disliked the image that he saw in it. People rebel against God's word because it tells the truth about them and about their sinfulness. 
The Greek word for wrath here, wrath here is orie. And as is the case with most words, its meaning can vary depending on the context, such as day of wrath, or um, as we have here, the wrath of man. In this case, it's wrath as a sinful human reaction rather than the righteous wrath of, of God. Human wrath, more often than not, results in actions that cause the situation to get worse. Very often, our wrath is misdirected, and we express our anger at God rather than at sin, which is, you know, if we're, if we're honest with ourselves, often our own sin that created the whole situation that we're in, right? So the ultimate goal for a Christian undergoing trial is the realization of God's righteousness in his life. The moral improvement a person can gain through trials is the last analysis, uh, a growth of righteousness and godliness. Let's, Let's read on, verse 21. It says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So James has revealed his reason for writing. It is instruction for the believer. And he opens up this this next section with two directives. Lay aside, that is, put away all filthiness, that is, moral uncleanness, as well as evil excess, and receive with meekness, that is, humbly welcome, the message of the implanted word. Now, we'll get to the save your souls part in a minute. In verse 21, James calls God's word the implanted word. As if borrowing from our Lord's parable of the sower, he implies that God's word is seed in the hu- and the human heart is soil. In his parable, which is in Matthew 13, Jesus describes four types of soil. Some hardened against the truth and unwilling to understand some shallow and, and unable to allow the truth to take root, some full of thorns, that is, the cares of the world and, and the deception of worldly desires, and finally there is the heart that receives the truth and thrives by it. Like a seed that has been implanted within them, the word has imparted new life to them. We might find born-again believers that, that fit these categories of soil. They're saved, though you may not know it by their lives. Some are quite shallow and have put little thought into eternity. They continue to live for the temporary pleasures of this age, but think little of the age to come and have little or no reward coming to them in eternity. Perhaps some of James's readers were like that, but most of them were probably confused by the actual trials that they were enduring at that time and they were looking for salvation and James says that the implanted word is able to save your souls oh but wait these were born again believers that James was writing to how is it that they are saved and yet needing to be saved well funny story when we see the word save salvation or saved in the text of the Bible, we are conditioned to automatically assume it's speaking of eternal salvation from hell. But that is not always the case. God can save people out of many things. Persecution, trials, physical destruction, being a few. The same thing with the gospel, which simply means good news. There is good news for non-believers That salvation from eternal condemnation and hell for sins is freely available. And there is good news as well for believers. For one, that God is faithful. And for two, that living faithfully for Christ brings rewards in eternity. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul said, therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. 
For a light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The seed of the gospel word that initially planted the seed from which the wheat developed contains enormous potential for the uh, born-again believer to grow in obedience to God. James says the same implanted word is able to save the life, which is the meaning of save here in proper context. The Greek word used for life here is suke. And in this context, it speaks of the condition of being alive. In other words, James is speaking of the physical preservation of a life from death. Now, the Bible states that the wages of sin is death, which is speaking of physical death, which for the believer means judgment, uh, for the unbeliever means judgment from sin and hell after death, and for the believer being in the presence of the Lord. The unbeliever is subject to physical death because of sin. Just like everyone, as since Adam's fall, death spread to all men. And of course, the believer is also subject to physical death because of sin. The obvious example to use would be you know, something like drunkenness, which can result in a, a quick death or a slow organ-killing death. But then so can also gluttony. And lying can also get you into all sorts of earthly peril. With the exception of those believers who will be alive at the rapture, we all die physically. But God's instructions can extend physical life, as is evident not only in the Old Testament laws regarding such things as diseases and foods, but also in the New Testament exhortations. Such as in Romans 12, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Or in Romans 12, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So you see, if we assume that save in verse 21 means eternal spiritual salvation, then we are exchanging the true meaning of the text, what the original author intended, with what we want it or we expect it to mean. We also then are twisting eternal salvation to be hinged on works. You know, the verbs lay aside or receive. Instead, what is clearly taught in Scripture is by grace through faith. Further misunderstanding, verse 21, result in misunderstanding of this whole book. Especially in, in chapter 2 when we get to the, the whole faith work section. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Well, if we're misunderstanding what is meant now, then by the time we get there, we're thinking, well, great, I guess I can, I guess I'm losing my salvation and gaining my salvation every couple of minutes of every day. And we don't have assurance. But we do have assurance. Because salvation, eternal life, is not by works. Simply grace by faith. If it were the other way, it would, in fact, contradict Jesus himself. Let's read on. Verse 22. 
But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Now, earlier James had said to be swift to hear. He's not leaving it that. It's not enough to hear the word, though it is commendable to, to seek out a fellowship where the Bible is being read and taught faithfully. But many people will hear the word of God, but then live as if they never, in fact, heard it. Many people have the mistaken idea that hearing a good sermon or a Bible study is sufficient. But hearing alone is insufficient in regard to what James is speaking about. To hear and not to take action is to lie to oneself. If you think you are spiritual just because you hear the word, then you're just kidding yourself. Too many Christians mark their Bibles, but do not allow their Bibles to mark them. If God is God, and God is good, and he has given us his written instructions that we may have abundant life, then we do well to put them to use. Earlier, James implied an illustration of soil and seed, and now he uses the illustration of a mirror. We all have mirrors in our homes, probably in the bathroom, but sometimes in other areas as well. Aside from a mirror being a design element just to kind of add some depth to a room, or perhaps maybe to freak out your cat or your budgie, the main purpose for owning a mirror is to be able to see yourself. But not just to see yourself because you're so entertained by looking at yourself but but to see yourself so that you can make changes and make your appearance pleasurable to yourself right in hopes that your appearance is pleasurable to others except when you're a teen then you just want to <laughs> well I guess it's the same when you're a teen probably more so I don't remember, that was like 10 years ago. Similarly, when we look into into the mirror of God's Word, we see ourselves as we really are. In our times, you know, we have mirrors that 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 deliver back to us a very vivid image. But in James's time, mirrors did not reflect back that much detail. They were often it would often be something like like polished bronze. You know, you wouldn't see a whole lot in that. But it was the purpose was still the same. One would observe himself or herself in a mirror in order to see how they look or if something needed to be fixed. So to the modern reader, James would be speaking of the Christian who is fascinated by the, the exposition of, and study of God's word, but who has assimilated very little of it into their lives. If you're, if you're going to a church where the Bible is rarely taught or, or, or taught in an unfaithful manner, then it's up to the Christian to find then a fellowship where the Bible is taught consistently and faithfully. And when you're in a church where the Bible is taught consistently and faithfully, then the believer should assimilate what they learn into their lives. And with this illustration, James mentions several mistakes people make as they look into this God-given mirror. First, they, they peek at themselves. They don't carefully study as they read God's Word. They don't study themselves. Many sincere believers read a chapter of the Bible each day, 
but they do so as only a religious exercise and they fail to profit from it personally. Their conscience would bother them if they did not have that, that daily reading, but only because really they're breaking a tradition that they've set up in their lives. The second mistake is they forget what they see. The text says he forgets what kind of man he was. You may remember a conviction you once had when you first received Christ. You saw this or that in your life and you were convicted to the heart by it. Perhaps today you look at that as well. Maybe you were just being overzealous at that time. But that cut to the heart response is absolutely biblical. In Isaiah 6, he cried out, Woe is me, for I am undone. In Luke 5, Peter declared, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And Job was the most righteous man on earth in his day. Yet in chapter 42, he confessed, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. When we see ourselves in the light of what God's holy word says, being convicted is not an overzealous response. As long as we are turning to God's grace rather than depending on our own efforts or ability to merit God's approval. Now mistake number three is failing to obey what the word says to do. Hearing is not the same as doing. If we are to use God's mirror rightly, we must gaze into it carefully and with serious intent, looking into the perfect law of liberty and continuing in it, both a hearer and a doer. We must examine our own hearts and our lives in the light of God's word. Of course, this requires some effort, Time, attention, sincere devotion. The Bible refers to Jesus as the Word made flesh and as the great physician. A good quality of any physician is is a faithful examination and truthfulness. I don't think any of us here go for a checkup at the doctor hoping that they'll just lie to us about what they see in the data, right? Right? We want to know, how are we doing? Do we have 10 more years? Do we have 15 more years? Do we have 20 more years? What do you think? What does the data tell you? Well, we're much better off with God's Word, of course, because the author is always true. His Word is always true. And what it tells us about ourselves is always true. Its diagnosis, in other words, of ourselves is true. So we do very well to heed what we read in God's Word. James says what is seen in the mirror is literally the face of his beginning. That is, the face, of, the face one was born with. Only I believe the birth here is not the first birth. But having been born again, it is the born again face. The face of regeneration being born into God's family. This born again reflection shown to them through the word affirms that they are in Christ. By grace. So then the idea is that recognizing who we are by grace, we then ought to behave that way. To be a mere hearer of God's truth is to forget one's true identity as a born again and justified child of God. And to behave in as though we aren't. With verse 25, James creates a contrast. He turns from the one who hears but does not do to the one who hears and does. And as we read these verses, you may have noticed that in verse 25, James gives this mirror a name. 
that name that he gives it is the perfect law of liberty. Now that seems odd when in many places in the New Testament the law is referred to as bondage, as a yoke, as a taskmaster, master, and so on. Well, Paul put it very well in Romans 7. There he said, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The law brings us liberty not because we are able to keep it, but because we can't. Instead, it speaks to us of our need for a Savior, and it sends us to Him. And this is why Paul in Romans 7 says, who will deliver me from this body of death? The very next thing Paul then says is, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so having been brought out of the condemnation of the law into commendation by grace, we are being sanctified and we heed the instruction of Jesus and, of course, of his apostles. James had heard Jesus when he said, if you abide in my word, you are my my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is what we might call free obedience by which we enjoy all the benefits of God given to believers. This kind of believer will be blessed in what he does. We do not become spiritually mature Christians overnight. It's it's a process. The work of the Spirit of God through the mirror of the Word of God. The important thing is that we wash up rather than trying to cover up. Right? We apply the soap and water of God's Word rather than putting on the makeup. David prayed in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And in 1 John 1.8, we read, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Instead of covering up, we receive the word and we put it into practice. As David wrote, Lead me in the way everlasting. Verse 26, If anyone among you thinks he is religious, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That word that is translated religious there is threskos. It means devout or or pious. In other words, devoted to proper religious expression. It's not a word that's often used in the New Testament. In fact, it's only used five times in the New Testament. Three times here in James, one time in Acts 26, and one time in Colossians 2. And there it's translated as worship. It has nothing to do with ceremonies, temples, or special days, except where in Colossians 2, Paul warns about the religion of worshiping angels. Religion here means practicing God's word and sharing it with others through speech, service, and separation, one's own separation from the world. Speech is mentioned many times in this letter of James. In fact, it's in all but the very last chapter. Jesus said in Matthew 12 that it is from the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So then if the heart is right, speech will be right. The idea that James has been reaching for is 
that religious practice that does not influence the heart and actions is worthless. A Christian might speak a big game but have very little evidence of their faith in their external practice. James says such a Christian deceives himself. Words are no substitute for acts of love that glorify God and demonstrate the Christian faith. The situation in which the churches James was writing was not perfect by any means. But neither were the churches themselves. In fact, James addresses some of these faults later on in chapter 4 of this letter. There were conflicts in the church between members. There were, the, some of the members were seeking pleasure and, and were being covetous towards one another. They were acting uh, worldly. It's likely that many of the believers saw themselves as being more observant than others and thus more worthy of God's blessing. Perhaps they were able to say all the right things, to dress Christian-like, to act above others, put, all, put on all of the right airs. In, in, in other ways, they were able to perform convincingly so that they would appear to be more religious than others. Well, you know, it was uh, 4 a.m. and I was in my third hour of prayer when the Lord revealed to me just what your problem is. But James is not concerned with religious exercises, however valuable they are in their place. Instead, he is concerned with down-to-earth conduct in relation to other people. And so James points out that pure and undefiled religion is not a show, it's not a performance, it's best expressed and caring for others. Sometimes our words might give the impression of commitment to God when our actions display commitment to the world instead. And by the world, James means society without God. In John 14, Jesus said that Satan is the prince or the ruler of this world. In Luke 16, Jesus said that the lost are the children of this world. And in John 17, Jesus said that as the children of God, we are in the world physically, but not of the world spiritually. James says to keep oneself unspotted from the world. The world wants to correct the Christian. The world wants to defile the Christian. Later in chapter 4, James will say, Will, it will tell us that the, the friendship with the world is enmity with God. First, there is friendship of the world, which can lead to a love for the world. Adulterers and adulteress, James will write in chapter 4, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If we are not careful... Friendship with the world will become conformity to this world. That doesn't mean we have lost our salvation or have laid aside or set aside our salvation. You didn't merit, merit salvation to begin with. How are you going to set it aside? If we are not careful Friendship with the world will become conformity to this world. This doesn't mean we lose our salvation. It means that we lose what we have lived for. Lot is such a good illustration of this. Remember, Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. Then next we read of him, he's moved into Sodom. Before long, Sodom moved into him. And he lost his testimony with his own family. And when judgment fell on Sodom, lost was saved, Lot was saved, yet he lost everything. And in that account, we find that it was Abraham, the, the separated believer, the friend of God, who had a greater ministry to the people than, than Lot did. The idea of bringing the world into the church to have a greater witness to the world diminishes the witness of the church 
It creates backsliding Christians. It promotes false conversions. It's not necessary for the Christian to get involved with the world to have a ministry to the world. Jesus was unspotted. And yet, he was a friend of sinners. The best way to, 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 to minister to the needs of the world is to be pure from the defilement of the world and to put others ahead of yourself. That's where I want to end today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning and thank you for this time that we have had studying through your word. Lord, I thank you that you are faithful. That your mercy does indeed endure forever. We ask you, Lord, to continue to teach us as the days continue and as you as you tarry, Lord. We look, look toward your soon return, but as you tarry, Lord, that we would continue to live in a way that is pleasing to you, that brings more and more into your kingdom. Help us to be doers of your word, not hearers only. So that when we are before you, we will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, thank you for this new day in which your mercies are new. Thank you for who we are and who we are in you. Lord, there are those who are sick in this congregation. We ask you would heal them. Those who are having just the difficulties of life, trials, and various things. And we just ask, Lord, that you would bring them rescue, Lord. You are our salvation. You are our rescue. Always and all times. Lord, help us to minister to one another. And show us how we can be forgiving toward one another and loving toward one another. In the very way that you are forgiving toward us and loving toward us. Lord, we pray for this world that, that your word would go forth through all the world and that many would hear your word and believe. whatever role we can play in that, Lord, I pray that we would be faithful in walking in that role. Thank you for each person you have brought here this morning. Pray that you would bless them in the word that they've heard this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face and His light to shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace, His shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, it's Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior, and everyone said, Amen. The object of faith is not the gospel, my friend. The object of faith is Jesus. Being at peace with God is, is not automatic, because you by nature are separated from God. The Bible says, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. You and I, we are both sinners. Every person is a sinner. And sin, our sin, separates us from God. Sincerity, morality, good works, a religion. These are some of the ways that man has tried to close the gap between himself and God. Only God's love can close that gap of separation between himself and in you. He paid the penalty for the sins of the world. The Bible says he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed.
But the good news is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as John the Baptist said, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Apostle reiterated this in 1 John 2, where we read this, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Because of this, despite the fact that we are sinners, we are not blocked from God and from His kingdom because of our sin. He has removed the sin barrier so that now we are all savable. All we need to do to have everlasting life with God, life that can never be lost, is to believe in Jesus Christ. As Jesus said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus very plainly says that whoever believes in him will not perish, but has everlasting life. Because of the cross and the, the resurrection of Jesus, all who simply believe in him have everlasting life and will one day be raised from the dead to live physically forever in perfect, glorified bodies. I can be absolutely sure that I have everlasting life because I know it has nothing to do with how good or bad I am and everything to do with Jesus' faithfulness to His promise. You crossed that bridge into God's family when you believe in Jesus Christ. And God invites you to believe and freely receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life that can never be lost.